All right, welcome to the July 23rd Aries Cloud Agent Python Users Group Community Meeting. Um, a number of topics on the uh, agenda, so we'll be pretty tight for time. Release 1.0. Um, Shell's here to talk about a new approach to the um, uh, Aries Agent Test Harness back channel. Um, Patrick about conformance with the W3C VCDM 2.0. And um, Daniel Bloom talking about did TDW. So lots of things to talk about along with release 1.0. Um, we are recording the call um, and I'll post the recording right here after that. Um, a reminder, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation co uh, antitrust policy is in effect and the Hyperledger code of conduct is in effect. So keep those in mind. Um, any uh, new folks that want to sh uh, share who introduce themselves and share what they're up to with Akapai or any announcements, grab the mic now. All right. Okay. Um, we will cut off at just before the hour today, because again, I'm speaking at the CCG in the next hour. So um, I will be um, heading to that call at five minutes two or so. So keep that in mind. Um, release 1.0, um, prepared RC5 last night, but the tests are failing. So there's an extended set of tests and a handful of them failed twice last night. Um, Jamie, you took a look at them this morning. What do you think? At least the last run said there was a problem with the tail server. So, and all the tests had the same problem. So, um, I'm, I don't think it's, we'll see, but okay. if the tail server is not working, then they'll fail tests. And I believe we use a local tail server. We don't use a BC gov one, right? No, we use Bonex, uh, deployed server. Oh, a deployed server. So is it up Remote and running? Server. Have we you you confirmed it's running? Yeah, I it's not. Well, it's getting a four hundred four, but I think the tail server on the root does get back a four hundred four. So okay, it, it's up. It's not completely dead. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. As I say, it did fail twice last night. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was having problems for both runs. Okay, I didn't look at the first one. Um, the as far as PRs going into um, uh, the release, um, we're down. We've got everything there. It'd be nice to get the LTS. Release update, Pradeep. I put some comments in there. Are you going to be able to update those, or did those comments make sense? Yeah, they make sense. So I'm updating as we speak. So I'll Perfect. finish it up and uh, make it ready for review. Excellent. That'd be great. I'd like to get that in there. So, okay, excellent. Um, and then um, the docs have been reviewed. Um, they need to be updated um, to the latest. So as soon as I get these, I'll I'll merge those in. But um, other than that, we I believe are ready to go on that. So that's good. Um, so that's RC five. Um, I don't didn't hear back of anything from RC four. So hopefully um, we'll get RC um, the the test cycle for RC5 will be relatively short, but we'll see how it goes. There was about 10 or 15 PRs um, in that. M many of them depend about ones, um, but a few um, content ones, including a couple of bug fixes. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, Sheldon, turning over to you on the back channel discussion. You ready to go? I am, thank you. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Yeah. Are you in a boat? I am. I thought so. All right. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay. 
So this is a, a just a, it's a proposal uh, to to spark some initial uh, uh, discussion on the feasibility of this. This was initially uh, proposed to me by Clesio uh, on the BC Wallet team, uh, and one of the use cases is for uh, a full blown wallet to be able to run with Aries Agent Test Harness automatically. So what we would like to do is develop a didcom based uh, uh, DRPC back channel communication protocol to facilitate the testing for any Aries uh, agent, including a headless mobile. So what that means is uh, we really would want to move the back channel into the domain of the frameworks. And we expose what the back channel does in Aries agent test harness um, just through the agent through um, the RPC, either through some sort of the, the, the wallet or the agents connecting to uh, the agent and then, can, then the or the, sorry, the, the test harness can connect to the agent through that protocol and then be able to call the regular things it's doing now through the API, HTTP API calls to the back channel, be able to call that uh, one API call through to the agent and then the agent does the things that it needs to do with that back channel logic now in its domain. The two things that it helps is that, uh, for one, that the frame, uh, the back channels then become the responsibility of the framework. So, of course, you know, uh, the back channels right now are, are ex ex external to the framework. So, you know, people have to remember that the back channels are there. Do they want to run their framework with the interrupt tests and that kind of thing? Uh, so this would put the onus on the framework teams to be able to um, uh, have that front end center to be able to do back channel development in the, in the framework. And it would could with the APIs and, and the uh, requirements for that could be in some sort of AIP level, whatever, or an RFC for it. Um, and then we make sure that frameworks in the future implement this protocol so that they can work with Aries agent test harness. The other thing this facilitates, of course, is what Classio wanted, is that a wallet, an implemented wallet, could uh, now work with Aries agent test harness and get the protocol, all these protocol interrupt tests running with a wallet sitting on a device. So a wallet would run on a device, um, the Aries agent test harness would do some sort of connection to it, and then the wallet would go into uh, you know, a non-UI mode, some sort of hibernation mode where it's only accepting the RPC calls from the test harness to run through all of these uh, uh, protocol tests to make sure it interrupts properly with whatever agents that uh, started in um, in Aries agent test harness. Um, so I brought this up to the test harness users group. Uh, some, uh, some concerns and questions came up at that time. Uh, one would be, you need a connection between Aries Agent Test Harness and the agent, and what kind of connection is that? Is that a DICON connection? And how is the Aries Agent Test Harness going to do that? Um, the Aries Agent Test Harness would need to initiate that connection because the test harness needs to be in control of when things happen. Um, the other thing we was mentioned, the test protocol, uh, the test protocol could be a plugin. So something somebody plugs into the Aries Agent Test Harness to get that functionality, or plugs into uh, Credo to get that functionality. Um, and then there was a question: we could probably get more buy-in if there was another use case to have a DRPC protocol um, besides testing. So, uh, real quickly. This is what it is. It, it is existing. So the Aries agent test service communicates with the back channel over HTTP. The back channel communicates with the, the component under test through the admin API, um, and then that you know communicates with the other component uh, agents under test. Um, and of course, the tests communicate with that one as well over HTTP to get these two going back and forth. So the new proposed one would be see the back channel moves inside of the agent. Um, so then it's out of the domain of the Aries agent test harness altogether. And there's some sort of communication, DIGCOM, DRPC uh, communication. This should be a two-way arrow, by the way, um, to the agent that then handles what back channel logic is called to do what the tests need them to do. Um, 
and still same dig communication between the other ones. So that I'm just pushing that out there. Any for 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 comment for discussion. Is this feasible to do at all, or is this something um, that may be a non-starter? I, I don't know. I think at least we'd need buy-in from Akapai and Credo to get this, give us some legs. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure wh wh where it would go. So, open the floor to thoughts uh, on this proposal. Sorry, I, I would raise my hand, but the, the UI for Zoom changed and I don't see the raise hand button anymore. Same here, uh, same here. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so there's something I, I didn't quite register last time. So this would require the actual test harness to do DIDCOM. It wouldn't just uh, uh, start the interaction and then all the, the DIDCOM DRPC happen between the agent, the actual test client would need to do DIDCOM here. Yeah, it would need to do. So I don't know. I guess it's didcom. Uh, it would need to do something to establish that connection through that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know of any other way to do it. If, if somebody can think of another way to 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 that initial connection uh, happen, so that that uh, the test can do the DRPC uh, stuff through that protocol. Mm -hmm. I and this um, didcom DRPC test harness. Would you see that as a something like a startup parameter for example or like you, you, it's not by default and the agent you sort of run your agent in test mode and then this is activated or would you see that as a full-on uh, permanent feature of the agents i would think it would be a full well like i said it could be a plugin and if the plugin is there yeah. it, it will run like it or it could be I, 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 it doesn't really matter i don't think as long as when you're running with the test this is enabled you know what i mean um, I would think if you're in, if you want to use a wallet, an actual developed wallet, uh, then of course your implementation would need to have this enabled. So it's waiting for a connection from Aries agent from test center. Yeah. My, the, the, the reason I was asking is more like, you know, is it a good idea to add something in a production system that the only reason for that thing is so that it can be tested, you know, it's kind of two, uh, two different environments. So that's why not? A concern. Uh, I mean, I mean, you enable usually when you want to test, right? You enable things that might not want to be configured otherwise, and it could potentially lead to some unexpected behavior. Or, uh, but well, but I don't think you would. There, you probably wouldn't deploy into production with maybe this enabled, right? But it's yeah, probably exactly. still there in the code in the code base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be my my thought is that you, if you don't want, you should not put that in production. Uh, that would not be my first reaction. Don't leave it on in production. Um, and if you do want to leave it on, there is other ways to secure the connection. For instance, before that connection, the connection gets established, but before it became becomes trusted you should do some sort of maybe proof request, prove to me that you are a, a, a trusted test agent and your agent codify what is your credential definition ID that you trust and so on. And now your connection is not that anybody who has a connection can run those tests, but anybody with that connection that has the right level of approval mm -hmm. that could potentially even be codified as a, as a credential. That 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 is what hardens security around that connection to make sure that only approved test agents yeah. or test controllers can actually run those uh, uh, those executions. Otherwise, That's you can connect, but it's just going to be a regular connection. You do not have privilege to run that kind of uh, uh, control. That's interesting. Makes me think of the discussion we've been having with the web and stuff, and how do you trust a entity interacting with you? Um, yeah, I think it's good. I like the idea of a plugin that you can turn on or turn off. And then if, you know, the, the fourth point, which was like, is there any other use case for this, right? Besides testing, then, you know, once this is in place for testing, then if it wants to be leveraged for, I don't know, maybe there's a use case I can think of one right now, but, you know, the RPC is a thing, uh, then it could be uh, hardened uh, further. So I... I also shout. I want. I want to make a point that 
uh, I propose this as the RPC because that's that's a protocol that exists right now that enable us to quickly implement new protocols. But this could graduate to be its own protocol at high level. So it's not, I, I don't think, I'm not proposing that this testing is always a DRPC protocol, but it could graduate once we figure it out. We start as DRPC. Once things working, we have run through how to secure properly and everything, it graduates to be its own top level protocol. And now it's just like a basic message protocol or whatever the next one is called. Um, given, given that um, the, the framework is now um, responsible for the back channel, how, how do you suppose the plugin is going to work in that situation? Not sure that I understand. The back channel is already very heavy and making it um, um, responsible via the framework. That, 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 that's a lot of work. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say it's, it's trivial. I mean, for, for the most part, um, you could take the existing logic as is and just, you know, put it in there as long as you as long as you know what it is it's, it's doing um, and then do every factor to clean it up later on. So I don't think the initial thing would be too difficult to, to move it in, but I, I, again, I don't know. I, will, will that mean um, moving um, totally from the current um, existing protocol, thereby separating the concerns and handing all the responsibility back to the framework. Is that is that what the proposal will mean? The responsibility for the trip with the back channel is a translation layer between the tests and the agent. So yes, that responsibility would move into the framework and all that logic uh, that translation layer would move into the framework to be their, their responsibility. Now, the responsibility, uh, there would be a responsibility to define what the API, the tests uh, expect um, there to happen inside of that translation layer. That would need to be documented inside of an RFC for people to implement. So that would be, you know, better documentation on, on, on that. Okay, okay, okay. So, um... The, the design you've got the proposed isn't quite accurate because the back channel is actually a controller. It's not yes. part of the framework. So now that makes a whole lot of sense. That that makes a whole yeah, lot of sense. So, so yeah. the DRPC, the DRPC protocol is already implemented in both, um, I believe in Credo and, and um, uh, yeah, Akamai, yeah, for sure in Akamai, yeah. and the back channel would, and the intent and the design of the DRPC is that it basically passes through the framework and goes to the controller to say, what do you need to do? Here's, here's some data, do something. And then it would do something under that. So it really is the controller. Um, the only difference is that the AATH connection is through the framework and then over to the controller, which is what enables the wallet to work. So a, a wallet to be used as a test agent, which is is pretty cool. Um, sure, AATH, that really should be AATH test should really be AATH engine. And that would mean sure, that sure. would have to become enabled. Sure, theoretically, what the, what the latency time for, for this whole connection protocol? like separating the concerns because that that's one factor that we should really pay attention to yeah what would be um, the latency for it so i i don't I, I think the latency will be probably higher than the current direct http approach potential i don't have any any number on that but I also think that the the testing harness protocol, the ATH testing reporting facility, is not necessarily testing the speed of things. It's testing the accuracy yeah. of, of of those those operations. So yeah. I don't think that the speed is necessarily a big factor, but it has to be reasonable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be. expect it to be too bad. 
Patrick? Yeah, I, and I agree. This is like interop, right? It's not performance testing. So that, that's where the difference is. Um, uh -huh. But I, I do agree with something that John is saying, which is, and I, I think I said that at the APH, is, and this is why like the Credo team needs to be, uh, uh, well, you know, involved in, in, the, in this discussion. Because one of the concern was that Credo wasn't maintaining their back channel much and other people had to do this maintenance for them. So I would uh, first try to see why is the back channel not being maintained and is this uh, going to be the same thing? Like, is this still going to be something that's not maintained in, in Credo if we want to add it or is this going to address that, that issue? Uh, is the fact that the back channel is an external API really the thing that adds a lot of burden to maintaining it or is there another reason um i i would argue it's still going to be external to the framework as i say the only thing that goes mm -hmm. into the framework in this design is the drpc protocol yeah nothing else goes into the framework itself it's still the back channel is still an external component which is a controller now it can be so built into a, you know, like bifold is a controller itself, so it could be built into bifold. Yeah. Um, but so does it mean it becomes like a DRPC controller? Is that no? Like I, I'm, I'm talking to like a the... like a like an Akapi controller or a uh, or any other. It's it's the controller is the the business logic that handles it. So the, yeah. So the DRPC right. goes in there and then the request gets passed over to the back channel controller via webhooks and so on. The same, you know, the same interface that any other controller business logic handles. The back channel is business logic. And it'd be just to be more precise, Shell, I think it would be within the test agent Docker container. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, let's assume that separation happens. How is the, um, how then, what's, what's the connection from the back server and the, um, the component itself now going to look like? Like, what's the logic behind that? It's going to be like any other business logic. So it's going to use HTTP requests using the admin API, for example, of Akapi, it's going to use the admin will, will API. That will that support, will, sorry, will that still support the um, the headless protocol that was um, one of the main keynotes? Would, would that support headless? I, I, so it depends. I don't, so, I, don't think, so, I don't think, I don't think that sorry. implementation would still support headless. So I was saying headless testing? Yeah, uh, that is the that is the main motivation of it is to support headless testing from from a from a wallet agent or from anything a that is. Agent, so yeah. you so you detach things. So the way that it's work is going to work is there is a provisioning state where you're going to stand up, Akapai agents or the agent that is under under testing could be Akapai, could be a Credo or it could be a a wallet like say Bifold. Those service needs to be started up. As yeah. part of that okay. initial 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 in startup, there could be some other admin functionality that needs to create an invitation to connect. That invitation to connect can either be multi-use or single use, whatever you define. If you want your security to be hardened, you create single use. If you want it to be more open for reasons, you could create a connection that is multi-use. Now you need to indicate that to the to when you to your ATH. The ATH just have connections to invite to a whole bunch of agents that is going to be testing. It connects to those agents. That special connection, um, it's kind of a privileged connection that that the, that is marked somehow. The connection gets established, so that forms a back channel between a ATH agent controller and an Akapi. Uh, Credo or Bifold as a kind of a, uh, the, the agents under test. Okay. Is it okay right. right now? That's the connection. Now I yeah. got a connection form. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. So from that connection that is form, ATH will then like, hey, um, agent A connects to agent B. Right. So it's going to yeah. send a DRPC message, say, hey, give me invitation to connect and uh, from agent A. 
and then it's going to send another DRPC, DRPC call to agent B and say, connect to this using this invitation. So now you okay. create an, a connection between two agents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, and then, and then now that you have a connection or you have a back channel connection and you have a connection between the agents, now ATH as a controller can now start orchestrating more of those logic, like say credential uh, connection A issue a credential to connection B because ATH will know all those metadata about those connections, which one is what, and ATH will be able to issue those commands in a, uh, in a, in a secure way. Okay. Does that does that make sense? Does that explain yeah, a little yeah, bit of yeah. the flow? Um, it, it it totally makes sense. It it makes sense. I I, I feel um, probably uh, the only missing piece now could um, possibly be um, making sure that um, the agents connecting to each other um, understand each other to get those meta data. Yes, and that's the implementation but, of this ATH protocol that we're talking about. So that yeah. this will this will be a little bit of RFC by itself. So it's, it's starting as implementation under the RPC um, mm -hmm. kind of JSON RPC protocol because those are already there, the building blocks, and we can implement as a controller. But it, once it graduates and we have a, a stable. Uh, kind of what are the operations that we're going to be needing? What are the responses going to look like? What is the, the metadata that ATH uh, needs? I can see this eventually graduating to become a top level protocol. And it's, it could be the RPC based and the message exchange could still be the same, but it's not running under the RPC, but a standalone protocol by itself. If if it's there is value, I think, that, yeah. I think at the end of the day, it's going to become its own protocol by itself. Yeah, the yeah. uh, RPC provides one of the main motivation for me that I propose the RPC is to provide a a place for us to rapidly draft and create new protocols that I don't know exactly how everything. I don't have all the answers yeah. resolved. So I, I can graduate, I can, I, can, I can evolve that protocol, getting to a more known state, and then it graduates to become a top level protocol. But that, that'll be the goal. My only issue with this right now is that how, are, how the tests are connecting to the agent. One of, one of, one of the rules, and not saying we can't break a rule, but you shouldn't, to, to the test uh, themselves shouldn't be using the technology that you're testing as part of the harness. So we'll be yeah. we'll be using a connection protocol to actually test the connection protocol between other ones. No, okay. yeah, that's... you know what I mean. So no, I would argue no, that, that... <laughs> I I wouldn't say we were doing that. We we used a connection okay. protocol. Sure, but but then we connected between the component under you know Alice and Faber. That those are the that's the test. The fact that it has right, to but work. part of the part of the infrastructure of the test is maintaining an actual connection from the test harness to both of those, and that connection protocol is what we're testing between the other ones. And if there's a problem, like I said, it's it's not a. It's not something we can't break, but if there's a, a problem with the too connection pedantic protocol, for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I think if there is a problem, I mean, the it's, it's going to be raised, and that's a good thing to know us, if there is a problem. <laughs> does this allow us to remove a separation between the Aries mobile test harness and ATH? Because I think what this doing is you spin up a a, a, a test harness, the engine, and it spits out an, an invite and then you pass that invite to four other agents and you're done you you can then run tests it, it does to some degree uh of course uh ui behavior is not captured here but you're testing the protocols underlying like i said the the the, the gui the UI is disengaged once it receives a connection exactly. from. Which is a good it, thing because yeah. because yeah. we're having lots of issues with, you know, with controllers. So anyway, um, we have yeah, to UI go on to the next a different topic. Problem. Emiliano, um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we can move on if you want, but like I just wanted to ask 
uh, for, kind of doubling down on a, on a question that Daniel had in the chat. One of the issues that we're having right now, as you stated initially, is the fact that not all agent implementations are actively contributing, I'll say, to the back channel um, development and maintenance. And I wonder, I was wondering how we're expecting these to to help that. Not, that seems to be okay. a big problem. Like so, the, because I guess the point is, if we still have the same problem, I'm not saying we shouldn't change, but maybe we should look at other ways of facilitating that. Because then we're gonna be back a step zero with, hey, we're using the RPC, which is great, but nobody's maintaining the RFC with with the proposed methods that need to be supported for the you know the testing because we're going to have to standardize that otherwise it's going to be a free for all again yeah it well, doesn't I, I, it doesn't change that in any way in my opinion yeah and i would say that's also not what it's trying to address right the, this is this the goal of this is not to address the fact that some framework don't maintain the back channel this is really to address mobile testing um, yeah, I, I get that. What I'm trying, what I was trying to say is like we might want to consider the fact, like that as well as as a driver potentially, because otherwise we're going to be back, you know, with a new thing but with the same problem potentially. That yeah. that's what I was going yeah, with. Not not, agree. not saying anything pro or against. Just kind of like a no, noting noticing that that might be a thing. Agreed. Awesome. Um, good discussion. Um, I, I would say we've got an issue on this. Um, Shell, if you could add the issue to the notes, um, people can yep. think on this and maybe we'll come back in a couple of weeks um, to the next meeting and, and have more of a discussion on this. And if anyone has um, steps for making it easy to get to here or, or um, paths to get here, um, that would, would be good. Be nice. It would be nice if uh, some credo maintainers could attend the next ATH meeting. I don't know if it's a time zone problem or if we could like request them so that you know uh, a lot of different maintainers discuss this together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next up, um Patrick, you want to go ahead? Yeah. I'll try to make this uh, fa fairly quick as quick as possible. So I'm just going to share my screen and explain a little bit uh what is it that I want to present. Um, so uh, verifiable credential data model 2.0. Um, so this is the W3C specification. It's uh, different than Anon creds, but not for very long because there's a lot of work being made around this. So the model 2.0 was drafted for quite some time now, and it's now in the candidate recommendation phase. Uh, uh, so that means that they are looking for implementations uh, to reach that threshold so that it's a recommendation. Uh, so there's been three more implementation, I think in the last week, uh, API catalog, uh, open security and identity, which is myself and it's what I wanna focus on and Spruce ID, uh, obviously Digital Bazaar, the uh, authors of the specification. Um, so current, historically, Akapai, I think in 2018, 2019, uh, got a, I believe it was a code with us or something, but they included JSON-LD credential issuance. Uh, this is what came with the uh, issue credential V2 protocol. Uh, uh, this is what enabled to, uh, alongside Anon cred, to also issue JSON-LD credential through the DIDCOM issue credential v2 protocol thanks to filters uh, so back then the version 1.1 was what was being used uh, and now we are starting to see uh, a lot of new requirements in um, other specification to recommend 2.0 because it's, it's reaching completion uh, so this is something that's been on my mind for for some time and now it is the time to start to think and align how can this be uh, made into Akapai. Uh, as I mentioned to some people, I would probably wait until it reached recommendation phase to fully implement it. An example, just two days ago, there was a significant change in the specification. So before something is implemented, I think waiting for recommendation is good. However, does not that doesn't prevent us from starting to think how can that fit in the current 
uh, Akapai model, can it just be added in the current design or is it going to require maybe some, some change or are change a, a good thing to do here? Uh, so this test suite here is the data model 2.0 test suite. Uh, it's based on this thing called the VC API, which is a HTTP API that just expose uh, issuance and verification endpoints. So uh, post a credential, receive a verifiable credential. Uh, one work item that I've been, um, I, I, I wouldn't say I introduced it in ICAPI, but I, I maintained it uh, because the initial work that was done for JSON-LD was based around the VC API. Uh, however, with with time, once that work was done, uh, it wasn't maintained, right? So I, I've been attending VC API calls. I'm, I'm trying just to make sure that ICAPI is still uh, enterable with the VC API because that gives a direct interface to ICAPI in these test suites. Uh, which I think is is very useful just to, um, you know, like we basically have tests written for us when we want to implement stuff. Uh, so the open and security identity is the uh, admin API of Akapai directly exposed. Uh, it's not obviously it's uh, it's on my fork and based on some work that I've done, I can I can share the link. And uh, once uh, all the tests are passed and the, the spec is pretty stable, then I'll, I'll start to discuss how can this be put uh, into Akapai and what's the best way. I can surely share the, a bit of the decisions I've made and uh, ask if this if people agree or not and what would be the best way forward. So there's a just a few tests missing. A lot of these are just some... Um, uh, you know, validation test on some fields. Uh, obviously they test like the credential status, terms of use, refresh service, credential schema evidence, which are things that Akapai, I think Akapai just does credential status field validation, uh, but these other uh, are very much in the specification. Uh, so I've added some of these in uh, my data model validation, which would be a, a great addition to the current credential data model validation um, and then uh, uh, same thing so a lot, a lot of it has to do with these credential status field um, you know and, the, and these are all well, so what they test here are all normative statements from the specification right so we can find this very statement uh, in the spec itself uh, and that's that um and then for presentations, uh, I think just there just needs a bit of validation on the verifiable credential array within the presentation. It's just a matter of doing field validation. So that's for uh, VCDM 2.0. Um, along with that, and this is where the discussion might get a bit interesting, is data integrity. So there was some uh, data work that started in ACAPI based on the add-on creds and data integrity, um, I had a, a bit of a look and it's something I, I'd like to start the discussion to say uh, what is the um, sort of medium to long-term goal about the work that's been done uh, currently. And I'll uh, share a bit my, my thoughts on that. Um, there's two, two uh, crypto suite that I'd like, and that's a sort of easy grab for ICAPI right now is the EDDSA are the FC 2022, which is the exact same algorithm as the ED25519 signature 2020. It's the exact same algorithm. The only difference is that the proof type is data integrity proof, and you have the crypto suite EDDSA RDFC 2022. Uh, so this is very easy to implement. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, I didn't validate the created and expires, uh, which are optional fields on the proof. This is uh, something that just needs to be added as validation. And uh, this one is one that I need to uh, look into is just to make sure that the proof is well formed uh, before verifying the credential. Uh, and then, you know, of course, interrupt is a bit of a mess right now. Uh, you know, this, this is a new thing, new implementers are implementing it. And we are trying to make sure that everyone can uh, verify uh, everything. Uh, so so far we're well the thing so this so this means the issuer so when ICAPI issues a credential with this crypto suite there's currently API catalog digital bazaar and open security that can verify and we can verify a credential issued by digital bazaar and of course 
Akapai can verify its own credentials. Um, and I'm, you know, I, we're currently working at seeing the rest of them, uh, how it can be improved. Uh, the second crypto suite, which is an easy grab, is the EDDSA GCS 2022. The only difference between these two crypto suite, well, this isn't the name. This one is an RDF canalization that is being signed, as this one is a JSON canalization, which is being signed. Uh, for those who are not sure what this means. So RDF means that you will um, ec you will uh, derive RDF statements from the JSON-LD context. And these RDF statements is the bytes that will be signed. So um, with JSON-LD, when you have a property and your credential, and that, by the way, that's the exact same way that ED25519 signature 2020 works. So when you have a property and a credential, it can be linked to a full length URL that should uh, lead to a description on the web, a very precise description about what that property means. And these full extended URI is what gets signed in the credential, not the actual property that you see, but the fully extended URI. So you, you do a RDF canonization before you sign the bytes. Uh, as with JSON, you just uh, canonize the JSON. So you actually sign the property as they appear in the credential. Um, so that's something that uh, is good to know. Both of these crypto suites can just use the current key pair that are present in Akapai. The other crypto suites that I would like to look eventually is the ECDSA. Uh, this I just need to, I haven't looked into it too much, but there, we just need to make sure that we can register uh, ECDSA keys, key pairs into Akapai. Looking quickly, there's already uh, those key pair classes in Akapai. I think there's just no real way to register a did using them. Uh, maybe Daniel, you know a little bit more about this than me, uh, but from what I look at the code, there is very much a ECDSA key pair class. I just don't think you can create a did with it right now. Uh, you can only create a did with EDDSA. Um, and then this one, you know, same same kind of tests uh, for ED2020 signature. So this already exists uh, into Akapai. Uh, I'm just going to show uh, just very quickly here. I have a little Postman collection. Uh, it's hidden by this Zoom bar. So I'm just going to issue uh, these credentials. Uh, so I'm going to create a did. Uh, this is just pointing to uh, this very agent that's being tested. And I just want to show the sort of payload that we can expect. So this is the uh, ED25519 ED signature 2020. So we have the credential and we have the options. Uh, and we provide the type of the option. And when we issue, we will have the proof uh, that he's using the correct type. So we have our type, verification method, proof, uh, proof purpose, created proof value. Uh, okay, then we can sort of just verify it. Uh, sorry, so I, I was doing some tests. So uh, this is another uh, credential. So let's just skip verification for now. Just take my word, uh, it works. Um, for the other ones, the options, you simply signify you want a type of data integrity proof and you specify the crypto suite uh, that you want to use. And this is going to give you uh, this proof that looks the same. So as I mentioned, RDFC 2022, ED25519 century 2020 is the exact same encoding algorithm. Uh, GCS, like the proof looks the same, but the actual bytes that are being signed are different, right? So uh, in this proof, we are actually signing the JSON canonization. As with RDF, we are sort of deriving RDF statements from this credential before signing the bytes. And the last one that I've been looking into is the VC Jose signature. So this is simply um, signing as a JSON web token and then putting this in the envelope verifiable credential. So for this, I just use the existing uh, JOT issuance, uh, you know, from the wallet feature that was already uh, applicable. And we get this ID here that is a data application VC JOT, and we just get the uh, actual token uh, down here. So this can be verified with the 
job.io. Uh, maybe I can just show this really quick. Right, so we see the credential here. Uh, I just need to I think it's 520 and the signature is verified. So this is working pretty well. I think there's no test for this yet, but this is just how it works. So data integrity, VCOSA, there are two different securing mechanism. And then within data integrity, you have different crypto suites. So this is the two layer of proof that are in the VCDM 2.0. Um, so now I just want to go quickly um, over. So one thing that I, I've noticed, and this is just, uh, you know, just some observation. So in the issue credential V2, there's a new format for VCDI. Uh, my observation is that in the current state, this works, but is a one-to-one -one tie to Anon creds on the indie ledger. Right. I would expect a VC data integrity to support multiple crypto suites. But when we look at the issue credential, uh, we are right away talking about cred def ID, ledger, uh, and these sort of things. What I would uh, like to see in the future is that this issue credential is dependent on a proof configuration. Um, if we have a look at these crypto suites. Uh, so I would also recommend uh, Anon Creds to define their crypto suite. Uh, somehow there are recommendations on how to do a crypto suite and to define what this proof config would look like. And in this proof configuration is where you would see your ledger, your credential definition ID, and so on. Because currently the issue credential of the VCDI can only issue and on creds. And uh, I would really like to see uh, this being able to also issue these other crypto suite. So, um, but I think yeah. this, is, this is fine. I do, uh, you know, like the goal here was to put anon creds in W3C and this is the goal that was achieved. I just think that now uh, it's a time to think like, okay, now that we have this, how can we, really see anon creds as what it is to data integrity, which is a crypto suite, right? That I think this is really the framing that needs to be put forward yeah. that anon cred is not data integrity, it's a data integrity crypto suite, the same way that DIBBS uh, is a data integrity. So that's one thing yeah. I would like to see. The okay. other, uh, just quickly, uh, the other thing um, I would question or more ask what is the future of VCLD? So that integrity is a replacement of VCLD. All the previous link data proof links now lead to VCDI. So I was, um, uh, you know, one idea that I could suggest is to just replace this with VCDI, right? And not yeah. have these two coexisting uh, and just look how this could be uh, done, you know? Um, yeah. And yeah, so and... Yeah, so maybe I'll leave it at that for today. We can have a, a, a more in-depth discussion about data integrity another time. I think there's another item on the meeting, but uh, I could maybe the next ICAP I could present a bit uh, yeah. how I've approached managing crypto suites and you know get feedback from. I, I know Daniel, you've been working a lot on this uh, VC link data, and I'd be uh, interested in knowing your your thoughts on this. So that that's I'm gonna cut it for for this for now before I okay I take too much. That's wild. Um, great stuff, Patrick. I agree on the the LD stuff you had there and the um, thing you commented about the need for for it being crypto suite driven, not not specific to non cred. So nice work there. Um, and and how we can evolve that um, would be very interested in that. Um, with this, I am going to turn over host roles to um, Daniel Bloom and presentation to um, uh, present on the um, on uh, the work he's done to initiate TDW and Akapai. Um, once he's finished, uh, I'm going to step away um, to prep for my next meeting, but I'll I'll leave the meeting running and then. Um, as I'm recording locally and then um, go from there. Anyway, over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Great.
Sounds good. Thanks, Stephen. Um, let's see. So what I've got to share today, and there is a link in uh, the agenda. Uh, let's see. Make sure I share my correct window here. Uh, but I will also just go ahead and I can get around the Zoom window. Uh, go ahead and share this link inside of the Zoom chat. <clears throat> um, OK. So we had a meeting a little bit ago as as maintainers of ActPy to discuss what it's going to take to implement did TDW inside of ActPy. Um, it was a really good discussion. Um, a lot of really good points were brought up. Um, I volunteered to start getting some of those thoughts down on paper, and um, I, I lightly evaluated code as well to kind of try to identify where some of the our pain points are going to be in implementing did TDW and see what we could do to um, either design around that or or how we need to correct those limitations. Um, so a lot of this information isn't particularly exciting. It's just some some boilerplate um, why we're doing it. A lot of the same information that was in slides that we um, have talked about previously in the DTDW implementation work. Um, but just a quick enumeration of goals. Uh, we want to be able to create DTDW dids, um, uh, including a convention as to where those dids end up being published. Um, so like where, what web server, what service we're using to, to uh, create those dids. We want to be able to do issuance for both uh, non and non creds and a non creds stuff, um, including the non creds objects uh, required to do non creds like schemas and and cred defs and such. We want to be able to do resolution, uh, including support for resolving the who is a verifiable presentation that um, asserts attributes about the did itself, um, and then we want to be able to verify uh, credentials, uh, including. VCDI, VCDI <clears throat> and anon creds and the resolution of the necessary anon creds objects to do that. Uh, non goals, I've listed pre rotation as one that we would address in the future. Um, it's kind of like borderline. It, it might make sense for us to just go ahead and take that, uh, that feature and implement it in the first pass. Um, but earlier on, maybe we just set it aside for the moment and focus on just getting the, the bare bones framework in place first. OK, so those are like the general goals. Um, uh, and then the rest of this document I have outlined very roughly. Um, these are pretty early. Uh, feel free to contribute to this document. Um, and I think this will be a, a continuing conversation going forward as we figure out what the right approach is. Uh, but here's here's some opinions, at least, on how we should go about doing this. Um, so first of all, for registration, creation of the TDW dids, uh, we need a registrar within ActPy. And my proposal is that we just include this as a new set of admin API endpoints. Um, this has come up a number of times over the past little while on different ActPy meetings, but I don't think it makes sense for us to create like any uniform, universal registration interface for dids because the uh, parameters and requirements of each did method vary so widely that a generic interface just delivers very little value. Um, so instead of doing that, uh, I think we should just have separate admin API endpoints where we can clearly define what our expectations are and requirements are for creating a did of that particular type. Um, uh, there is uh, a new recommendation that I propose here, which is that we start uh, having endpoints that create dids be just slash did slash method slash something, uh, whatever uh, operations are required to create that did or or interact with that did or updates, whatever it is. Um, so for example, we would have did method create or, or did TDW create. Um, so I think that applies generally. Um, I, that's a pattern I think we should start implementing uh, within ActPy. I would even propose moving some of the like wallet did creation methods out into separate endpoints. Um, so we can do did peer creation, we could do did solve creation, we could do did key creation, and just have those be independent endpoints as opposed to being combined all in one. Um, 
Yeah. And then specifically for did TDW, um, I think what we should implement directly with the NACPI is uh, an, a relatively opinionated uh, implementation of, of the did method, um, at least as it pertains to where that's going to be published. Um, so we should have uh, an external server interface that we we know and, and we implement against. And then if there are other implementations of like uh, did web server, for instance, that we'd be publishing these dids to, those can be implemented as separate did methods, or excuse me, as separate plugins to ActPy. Um, and that can just be a concern of those who are interested as opposed to what we implement directly within the ActPy interface. Um, my my next proposal for the did TDW creation is that rather than giving granular control over key creation um, and then assembling a did document and then um, handing over the did document to the did create endpoint, um, which would require the controller to be very aware of like did doc conventions and and keys and key material and stuff, um, not to mention the the complexities of representing those keys and and like having meaningful identifiers associated with them, I think it would be better from an interface perspective, as well as um, simpler uh, for implementation to instead select features that we want the did to support and then focus on that. Um, and uh, maybe at some point in the future, we could provide granular control to a controller to say what keys are expected or, or should be included. Um, but I, I think it makes more sense to just focus on the feature. So if we want didcom v1 to be supported by this, the TDW did, then we'll make sure the endpoint will make sure that the correct services are included and a set of keys are available for that didcom uh, communication. Same thing with didcom v2, uh, just include the didcom v2 services and keys. Um, and a non creds, uh, similar. I don't actually know off the top of my head exactly what it what is required for a did TDW did TDW did to support an on-creds if there's anything in particular that needs to be included in the doc to support it. Uh, but if there is, um, declaring that we want to support the non-creds feature would be the way to make sure that those get included. Um, same with VCDI. Uh, and we could also include like number of pre-rotation keys, which kind of gets back to my point of, I'm not sure if it makes sense to do pre-rotation pre on a first